Well, with all the crazy shit going on in pro wrestling right now, what with the rumors of Cody Rhodes coming to WWE and Stone Cold Steve Austin somehow, some way, making his way onto the WrestleMania card this year, here we are talking about probably the shittiest thing we could talk about right now, Unforgiven 2003 on this retrospective, Tomas. Absolutely. You know, we got to bust out, you know, the irrelevant shit going on right now. And, you know, we might as well talk about the WWE stuff now because we are not looking at Elimination Chamber for a no. couple of reasons. Mm -mm. Number one, it's a Saudi Arabia review. Number two, I'm going to be in Disneyland this weekend. So yeah. I'm going to do my best to not think about that pay-per-view and maybe watch it in little spurts when I'm in the hotel. <laughs> but I yep. was telling Zach earlier, I hate how much that pay-per-view has WrestleMania implications on it. So I kind of have to watch it. It's not yep. a throwaway Saudi show. Like they're going to determine who's going to fight Becky Lynch at WrestleMania. They're going to determine who the WWE champion is. They're going to de de determine who the Universal champion is. Uh, Matt, well, uh, Matt and Drew McIntyre having a false count anywhere match for some reason. It's it's going to be Roman Reigns retaining over Goldberg for sure, and we'll get to Goldberg. Um, yeah, well, w yeah, WWE I, title very much up in the air. I'm hoping Lashley retains, and it's not title for title between Rock and If uh, Lashley there, doesn't but... retain, the only thing I will accept is AJ Styles winning. I know that's far Please. off WWE's radar right now, but if you're asking the fan, I'm just saying. If Lashley us... doesn't retain... I will take Styles, and for a hard third, I'll take Seth Rollins. Give give us something fun, WWE, please. Um, yeah. I, I wanted Unforgiven 2003 to be fun on a rewatch. I remember watching this show live as a kid. Um, but going back, this show was bad. <laughs> it was yeah, really I bad. I was saying, I don't remember why, but I begged my parents to order this pay-per-view for some reason. Maybe it was because I knew Goldberg was going to win the championship on this night. I don't know <laughs> why, but... As a nine-year-old kid, this is all I remember. I remember Goldberg going in and just squashing Triple H. And spoiler alert, that's pretty much what happens. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a very Basically. eventful show. No, this show not... does plant the seeds for future storylines coming up that will culminate at Survivor Series, which we'll get into very soon. But oh, other than so that, this is, a, this is a bona fide Monday Night Raw with a special match here and there. Yeah, most yeah, most underrated Survivor Series of all time, in my opinion, coming up on this retro very soon. And, of course, we're talking about wrestling all the time here every single month, except for uh, if blood money is involved. We're not going to be talking about that. So smash that subscribe button as hard as you possibly can. If you want to keep up on these uh, 2003 retros, going into 2004 from the looks of it, um, if enough people want to hear us talk about 2004, I am so game for that. That is a great year in WWE, in my opinion, at least. Oh, um, yeah. At this point, I we better be doing all the retros because I'm having too much fun doing this. Yes. Yeah. No, that that's the plan for sure. Smash and that thumbs up as well. if you guys haven't noticed, I'm in a new recording spot. So that's I right. have a lot more fun now that I'm not fucking straining my back sitting on my bed. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is there a lot go. more comfortable just going to tell you right now. Totally. Totally, man. It feels more comfortable with this. But, uh, yeah, we'll also be talking about AEW Revolution next month, and that review will be coming a little bit later because I will be in tech for my show the day of Revolution. I'll be in performances. So, when I was yep. watching AEW and they said they were mentioning Revolution, I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, a pay per view is coming up. AEW has not talked about it at all except for a ladder match, which Keith Lee is going to be in. Thank Congratulations you. to Keith Lee don't, for making don't. his AEW review. Don't fuck him up, Tony Khan, please. It's just wrestling is not that hard. Don't fuck him up. I want to see him on Dynamite every single week. I want him to be in big hoss fights with Wardlow and Miro and fuck it, Lance Archer. I want to see him winning championships. I want to see him in the main event. Strap the rocket to Keith Lee. Do what WWE did. It. Don't fuck uh, him up. Just don't, uh, just don't Jay Lethal him, and I think we'll be fine. Um, but yeah. in any case, uh, Tomas, getting back to Unforgiven 2003, we start off with a uh, very interesting match that I, uh, you know, honestly, looking at this whole card and looking at the star ratings, I'm just going to go ahead and list them off right now. This just tells you how bad this show was for me. Star and a half, zero, three and three quarter, two and a half, two and three quarters, three and three and a quarter, Nothing minus in this two. Show. Minus Nothing two. Nothing in this show breaks the four-star barrier for me. And no. 
we'll be getting to more in detail of that later just to bury the lead. But not to yeah. take away your intro, but it's a raw pay-per-view. And you know what that means? The Dudleys are opening the show and they're challenging for the World Tag Team title. <laughs> Have you noticed that's been a theme all year? All year. Oh, I'm so sick of the Dudley boys in these tag team title matches, man. <laughs> you thought every... the tag team title scene or the tag team scene was dry now? It feels like it was even more dry back then because the Dudleys are either defending the titles or they're challenging for the titles. I know SmackDown had the heftier tag team scene, but Raw really had nothing going for it. Again, Dudleys are either challenging or they're defending. No, no. And like, I and mean, if they don't win the titles, then they're bound to win them at the next pay-per-view. And this is a weird match because this was marketed, as you see on the screen right now with the graphic, as a six-man tag team tables match involving Spike Dudley, but he took a nasty bump about 13 days before on Raw where it looked yeah, like he was decapitated was never intended to be for the tag team titles, which we'll get into for a second. But like you mm -hmm. said, it's an infamous spot. Law Resistance, there were two tables outside of the ring, and the plan was that Law Resistance was supposed to hit their patented double spine buster over the top rope and smash Spike through both tables. He whiffed the second table and just... Oh, no, there wasn't even a second table. I'm sorry. Oh. They missed the table entirely, and Spike's head just smacked the fuck out of that table didn't even budge, didn't even break, and he went crashing to the cement below. I don't get how he's not dead, let alone on Raw the very next week, taking another table spot from La Resistance. So basically, they just say, okay, we fucked that up. Let's run it back and do it again. And right. that broke Spike off the TV. This was never supposed to be for the tag team titles. But Stone Cold Steve Austin came in at the last second, told La Resistance for injuring Spike, you're going to have to put your titles on the line in a three-on-two handicap tables match. If you think that's weird, SmackDown is just going to do something just as weird at the beginning of 2004. Uh, yeah. We will, well, we will just as just as weird even next month at No Mercy, which we'll certainly talk about. But um, this match, honestly, I you know I watched this last night. I was texting Tomas as I did it live, as I usually do. And there was one thing that really pissed me off above all else. And I told Tomas to take a wild guess as to what that was. Um and if you guys haven't figured it out, these fucking idiots were tagging in and out when there was no disqualifications in the first half of this match. Like, what's the point? You know, what's the point? We just watched Royal Rumble 2000 where they yeah. had a tag team tables match. And I know I'm usually the one to kind of run in and sort of defend this to, like, control the pace of the match. When literally the month prior to this show, we got the traditional regular two-on-two -two tag team title match between the Dudleys and La Resistance. There's no reason to run it back again, and this should have been all mayhem. And I know yeah. Spike's not there, but this match can still be mayhem. They could isolate one of the Dudley boys, get him out of the equation, and then like three on one another one. You know, that's, there was that's no what reason they did for this match. That's what they did. Devon, Devon went through the table after uh, you know Sylvan, I believe, whipped Devon through a table in the corner, and it was three on one. Bubba had to fight out from underneath, but. Devon could still stay out there and help him out. The Royal Rumble 2000 you know, rule. This match was 10 minutes long. Um, but one thing that I want to bring up when, okay, one of my favorite WrestleMania matches of all time is Angle, Mysterio, or in the World Heavyweight Championship. Did mm -hmm. you know that that match was only 12 minutes long? I, I knew that. I thought it was even shorter and than that. That match from start to finish was a million moves a minute. Mm -hmm. I would rather them cut the time of this match in half and have a non-stop action, then drag it out the way they did. It was I boring. like that triple threat match as much as I did if it was 20 minutes long and it was just or in an angle trading rest holds while Mysterio mm -hmm. recovered on the outside for half of that time. And I yeah. love that match because literally the minute it started, there were Hurricane Ranas, there was throwing out of the ring, there was angle slams and RKOs and ankle locks all over the place. Yeah. So I would much rather have that style match and it be short than this painful slog. And I'm going to be saying that a lot in the show. Painful slog. Painful slog. And, uh, you know, Bubba was fighting out from underneath three on one. Um, he was not apologizing to the fans for being vulnerable in this situation. But in any case, I mean, he's throwing Sylvan all over the ring. He's put through a... Bubba, there's a suplex on Grenier that's very easy. He puts Sylvan through the table. No harm done there. But then <laughs> this is this is where it gets interesting. 
the Dudleys, Devon has not left the ring area at any point throughout this match, by the way, even though he's eliminated. Um, the Dudleys hit their what's up, um, and then what happens is they grab Rob Conway. There's two tables set up on the outside, side by side. They do the patented La Resistance finishing move on Rob Conway, and he takes the exact same bump Spike Dudley took. Looks like he damn near got decapitated, and I thought he was dead as a kid. I legit, looking at this pay-per-view when I was like seven years old at the time, I thought he was dead. You know, I was like, he t they just took his head off. Oh, my God. Like, oh yeah, not and a safe bump. <laughs> like I was telling Zach at the end of this match, I love how Rob Conway was just introduced into La Resistance, and he's getting played <laughs> as the heavy. Yeah. And first of all, Conway's not a heavy. No. You know, he's not. He's just a muscular, he's, he's a muscular, good-looking dude, and, you know, he's not that much bigger than uh, Dupree or Grenier or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, he's not an Omos, he's not an Eric Roman, no. he's not a, <laughs> a big show, he's not a, he's none of that. He's just a third member of the squad. If anything, mm -hmm. he's the numbers game, but when they were coming out and they were posing, it's just like, why are they trying to pu put up Conway as the heavy, considering the gimmick they would give him, like, two years later, like... It doesn't work. Yeah, that, also, that, that gimmick. That gimmick. You want to hear a realization that I had that's going to blow your fucking mind? Yeah. The British invasion from TNA was their take on La Resistance. Oh, my God. It totally was. It yeah, totally was, wasn't it? I Rob thought, Terry. oh, yeah, Rob Conway. And then I immediately thought, Rob Terry. I'm like, no fucking way. This is, TNA was trying to do this <laughs> with the British invasion. Yep. No but the difference way. is. The difference is Rob Conway was not a French dude. Rob Conway, like, exactly. you know, Rob Conway was an American guy who was a French sympathizer. That was his gimmick. But Rob yeah, Terry was it, actually, Rob Terry was actually British. So, yeah, exactly. I'll give TNA credit for one thing with that. And that's that Terry was actually British and Terry was a better heavy. Yeah. He a Terry shit wrestler, like a heavy. He was a, yeah. He was a shit yeah. wrestler, but at least he like, was a good heavy. Mm -hmm. And as Jay would said, buy it. For the seventeenth time, the Dudley Boys have won the World Tag Team Titles. Yeah. The Dudley Boys are my favorite tag team of all time. Uh, but when I hear that they're like twenty-two time tag team champions, a lot of their title runs came in this era when they literally had nothing to do but win the tag team titles. That's right. That's Years right. later, go back to the New Day's run. They are eleven time tag team champions because they were also from an era where they were the only team to win the tag team titles. They hit, um, yeah, as just as predicted, they hit a 3D on Rene Dupree, which I do think was good booking on the part of, like, the order of elimination for La Resistance. I think saving Rene Dupree for the end just shows that WWE had a lot of hope for Rene Dupree. They thought he had a lot of potential. I certainly thought he had a lot of potential back in the day. Um, but we'll we'll get to whether or not that potential is realized but yeah, yeah and not to jump ahead they knew they liked law resistance when they let them cut a promo with the rock when they oh, let you interact with yeah. the rock they like you who in the blue hell are you two french popcorn farts right here <laughs> <One of those. laughs> exactly he's not he's not cutting an intense promo like he did before the super bowl where the stupid rams won the lombardi trophy last sunday but uh anyway um this is a star and a half, it's a, you know, it's a match, you know, it was probably, Tomas described it to me as the most underwhelming tables match of all time. I think that's very, very accurate, my friend. Um, I really could not get into this thing up until the, you know, Rob Conway bump, which meant that there were only like two minutes left in the match. I should, I should be into it the whole way. Should have been massive amounts of chaos, but that was not to be. That was oh yeah, not to absolutely. Be. This was, again, an underwhelming finish to a somewhat decent tag team feud and yeah like i said we already had the match of SummerSlam, and then it's just you know and again law of resistance was a good gimmick that was getting a decent push and they just kind of you know just for the sake of putting the titles back on the dudleys you know i wouldn't have been mad if law of resistance won this match no no, I wouldn't have been mad at all, but, I mean, considering where they're going at the next Raw-exclusive pay-per-view, Armageddon, which won't be for another few months on our end, um, makes sense that the Dudleys would be the ones to uh, win the titles and uh, who would get them afterwards. But up next, my friend, are you excited for this match? I certainly am. Oh. <laughs> this got a video package a big, like, you know, like, you know, this wasn't the exact pay-per-view song. For some reason, the Peacock version of this dubbed over the Seven Dust music at the beginning. But 
it got a weird like Coldplay soundtrack behind it, and it was Scott Steiner versus Test. And here's the stipulation: so if this sounds familiar, good. If Scott Steiner wins, Stacy Keebler becomes his manager again, exactly like Bad Blood. But if Test wins, then this time to spice it up, Scott Steiner becomes his biatch, whatever that means. So. <laughs> Oh man, Tomas is this not feud happy with this. Started at Backlash in April. Yep. Kill it me. Is September at this point, and they are still going with this feud. They're still they did still doing it. The same match at Insurrection, Bad Blood, and I don't care if the Steiner stipulation is here. It's the same fucking stipulation. It's the same match. It's the same old shit. Test, bless his heart. May his soul rest in peace. He tried his best to make this match if as good as you it was. You ask me, this, as crazy as it sounds, the Bad Blood match was somehow better. I I don't understand how. I think it might have been because of the test bump that he took, like the chair bump, because that was he had the gimmick where he had the steel chair. It yeah. ricocheted off the top rope, smacked him in the face. But um, Also with that... You know I hate this storyline, and when you break it down, this is what it is. Test is an abusive asshole that wants Stacey Keebler as his manager. Scott mm -hmm. Steiner objectifies Stacey and also is an abusive asshole, but he's a nice guy. So yeah. basically, take your pick. Who do you want to be with? Or I don't know, maybe don't treat Stacey like a dog and let her pick for herself. Or better yet, in character... Just have Stacy run away from both of them. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Like, just have her get involved with the Dudleys again. Wasn't that working out well for her? Exactly. Back in, like, I think early 2002? She was much better <laughs> off as the Duchess of Dudleyville. Come she on. never was in this role. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they still objectified Stacy Keebler as the Dudley Boys manager, and she got involved a lot, but at least she wasn't, like, she didn't have to pick between two assholes. Exactly. You know? So... Oh, Nothing happens in my this head match. spin. No, yeah. The only thing that really happens of note is Scott Steiner sandbags Test furiously on a belly to belly suplex. Got again, bless Test's heart. He was playing his character so over the top. He was trying to make this as important as it could be, but um, nothing really. But have you noticed that happens. between this, between Scott and his nephew, What's WWE's issue with not just turning them heel and letting them in heel because that's what they're good at? Yeah, let Bronson Steiner be a heel NXT champion, please. That would be great. Um, I'm sorry, who? Uh, Bronson Steiner. I, you know, I, I don't I'm know who not. That is. <laughs> no, I, I, I know who that is. is. I don't who, think who WWE he? knows who that who is. is. Wait, wait, you said he's the NXT champion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're talking about Braun Breaker. No! No! <laughs> You're talking this about not, Braun Breaker, aren't you? This is not the only time he's going to torture me on the air, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, um, who do you hate more, Braun Breaker or Dolph Ziggler? Uh, Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler. That's oh, no well, I got some bad news for you. Uh, no, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I, I, I don't, okay, I I don't want to fucking talk about Vengeance Day. But, uh, yeah. So, Stacey That's Keeper, sad. That's actually sad that we're saying that. that yeah, we don't Nick talk Patrick. Yeah, Nick Patrick. So Nick Patrick, who's the official, is getting, like, abuse in this match. I mean, he's doing his typical slow counts that we've gotten used to since Starcade of 97. But um, he he was getting thumbs to the eyes. He was taking ref bumps in here. And I'm like, this is fucking Scott Steiner versus Test. Like, why do you need a ref bump? You know, like, you really don't need a ref bump for this match. It only went seven minutes. Seven minutes too long. Seven minutes too long. Exactly. Exactly. So... Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see the thumbs up on the recording that he just shot out, but, uh, test is, uh, so test hits a huge, big boot to the, uh, huge, big boot to the face. And he does to test credit. There is a loud snap on the big boots, both of them throughout this match. Um, you could hear them all the way over in uh, Philadelphia from the Hershey metropolitan area. Um, and we're on that I later. Mean, yeah, yeah, there is a there is an ear fall in there. Um, Stacy Keebler takes the chair that Tess tries to bring into the ring. Stacy swings at Tess. She misses. Scott Steiner takes the cheesiest bump of all time. Tess smiles, hits another big boot for good measure, and puts this feud away mercifully at a zero star rating, ladies and gentlemen. This was not Tess's fault at all. <laughs> not Tess's fault. He tried.
yeah, this was terrible. I hated this. Uh, you don't need to do the same match three times in a row, which is basically what they did. Mm -hmm. And spoiler alert, nothing comes from this. Literally nothing comes from this. They finally turned Steiner heel. Which they should have done which, from the beginning. Which when we get to Survivor Series, all I'm going to say is you're a little too late on that WWE. You're a you, you totally missed the, the that ship sailed years ago. Yeah. Years ago. Way um, behind. And then, Way behind. Yeah, I think I think we will get into the fate of Steiner when we get to the end of 03 because hang in there, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's almost over. <laughs> it's it's almost it's almost over. And uh, you know, I probably will not need a fucking mic anymore for that. But uh anyway. Um <laughs> Well, I mean, even though I'm gonna be holding the mic, you know, but um, yeah, but bad match, yeah, kept the feud going, and then, you know, it just <laughs> fell flat on its face on Raw, but, uh... Ooh, and let me tell you, too, huh. my very much enjoyment, we got something next that was actually very good, um, as I adjust my camera. Um, <laughs> You're good. For the first time ever on pay-per-view, it is Randy Orton versus Shawn Michaels being labeled yep. Legend versus Legend Killer. That was a little cheesy, but I will let it go just for the sake of... This was a really fun match. Uh, not really much a story here, just Orton's establish establishing himself as the legend killer. Michaels is the nearest legend he saw, and fuck it, let's get it on. This was my match of the night for uh, for anybody watching this right now or listening, however you uh, absorb our content here. Um, Randy Orton debuted on pay-per-view as, uh, as the chosen prodigy for Evolution and that stable not too long before this. This is his first of many pay-per-view one-on-one -on -one matches, and here he is taking on arguably the greatest of all time and Shawn Michaels. Um, and damn it, Shawn Michaels got a really good match out of him. Randy Orton was really holding his own. He showed a lot of promise here very early on in his career. And I believe he was only, yeah, he was only 23 years old at the time. And, uh, you know, he had a very high ceiling even then. Um, was hitting... this Orton's first pay-per-view match one-on-one? -on -one? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. he uh, he was at SummerSlam. Yeah, he was in the chamber. So this was his first one on one match on pay per view. So and um, this was his real test. And the way Shawn Michaels was guiding him through this match, I think Orton passed with flying colors. This isn't his ultimate test. We will get to that much later in 2004. But yep. I really do like the way this match went. It's not the best match in the world per se, but I thought the pacing was really good. The spots were really good and. It's Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels can't have a bad match even Honestly, if he tried. Honestly, yeah, Shawn Michaels could wrestle Dolph Ziggler, and the match would at least be four stars. You know, oh, I would make that happen. enjoy the hell that out of it. That could be arranged. <laughs> See, now I'm, hey, giving Stone Cold come back. <laughs> now I'm giving Tomas ideas here. But, uh, yeah, Stone so Cold can come back. <laughs> this was – Ziggler's got to need something to do. <laughs> this yeah. was uh, – no, Ziggler does not need a WrestleMania match right now. But, uh yeah, Shawn Michaels, you know, this is old school NWA style wrestling psychology, which is honestly perfect for Randy Orton at this point in his career. Because he also, ironically enough, had Ric Flair in his corner for this match. The only time we'll be seeing Ric Flair on this card, by the way, he will not be accompanying Triple H to ringside, which should pay dividends for that world title match. But I know this is random and off topic, but when I was watching that entrance, I, ran I randomly thought, remember when Ric Flair was randomly Orton's manager last year or in 2020? I remember that. I the remember that. The performance yep. center era? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then R Randy Orton kicked him in the fucking head right before he challenged yeah, Drew McIntyre. <laughs> There for a couple of pay-per-views where Flair was there, and I'm just like, huh, yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But honestly, man, there were some there was some really nice chain wrestling in this match. I could honestly call this match great. And this is not the only legend versus legend killer match that will be considered great. My only real so first of all, before we get to the finish, Ric Flair was so goddamn entertaining in this match. Like, you know, at ringside, like Orton and Michaels were playing their roles to perfection. Ric Flair, his antics could have been very much upstaging what was going on in the ring, but say what you want about him personally, but Ric Flair was a master at being the entertaining heel manager on the outside during the Ruthless Aggression well, era. And, and in the difference between this and other matches was, Flair wasn't the best thing about this match. Flair added to it. He, he added some Flair, pun 100% intended. Oh, get out of um, here. Get out of here. But, yeah, <laughs> this, this wasn't Royal Rumble where he's stealing the spotlight. But again, 
that was Royal Rumble we're talking about. So, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think that just added a little extra to this match. Mm-hmm. You are allowed to upstage Scott Steiner in 2003, but uh, Shawn Michaels, there was a point where uh, Randy Orton hits his finisher, which JR does call the RKO at that point, and that's a name that would stick. Those three letters would stick throughout the rest of uh, Randall Keith Orton's career, oddly enough. Um, and to Michaels, the rest of his career, he is still going strong today. I don't mm-hmm. see Randy Orton not slowing down at any point. No, no, not at all. He's in his mid forties right now. I want to say, and that's like prime for WWE for some reason. Uh, unless you're Tom Brady, you're retiring right now. But uh, you know, if you're forty three, you still go in WWE. But uh, Orton it's hits crazy the RKO. To say Orton could easily have another eight years left in his career. <laughs> Which is nuts, but yeah. Um, here's one nitpick I had with this match. Um, Shawn Michaels kicked out of the RKO. Don't you want to build up that finisher as being lethal? You know, yeah. like have no one kick out of the finisher. I don't think it took people so long to kick out of the pedigree. It took people so long to kick out of the F5. RK the RKO should be up there with those two finishers, at least in my and opinion. And how crazy is it? Like just as recently as like 2018, 2019 that the RKO was more protected than the F5. So yeah. in its early stages, it took a while for that to be the move to not kick out of. It only takes one. It only takes one for sure. Uh, but Sean hits a uh, hits his uh, trademark flying elbow drop for a nice near fall. fucking beautiful. It is such a, such a beautiful elbow drop for sure. Seeing Shawn Michaels do that in his prime is also just him and Macho Man Randy Savage. Watching them do the elbow drop is just sheer perfection. Not CM Punk. <laughs> I said Macho Man Randy Savage and Shawn Michaels. <laughs> oh man, I Don't can't wait. To... Say it. Da, 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 da. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. No, he does not hit an elbow. Oh, drop. you're right. You know what? Not just Michaels and Savage. Uh, Bailey too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bailey. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That's Get it. Yeah. Soon, Nobody Bailey. else. I hope to see her just soon. Three. But uh, just, so. Just yeah, Shawn Michaels does kip up, and the crowd is – I think the crowd was into this match the most out of anything else on this card. Um, he hits the sweet chin music. Referee Earl Hebner counts one, two, three. Michaels' music plays, but before the ref counts three, Ric Flair at ringside, who is selling something. Shawn Michaels was uh, knocking him off the apron quite a bit. Flair was trying to run interference, but on the outside, Flair puts Randy Orton's right foot on the bottom rope. As Michael's music is playing, Earl Hebner spots it. He thinks it's an error. He's like, no, no, I can't. I have a nitpick. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. So I know this is pro wrestling, and we don't use logic in pro wrestling, and you got to turn off your brain, but (laughs) I have noticed something that is a little inconsistent. Yeah. If you get your foot on the bottom rope after the referee, after the referee counts to three, it doesn't matter because the ref got to three first. If he got it before then, you know, then it's fair game. If Earl Hebner saw that, the logical thing to do would have been, hey, run the replay so I can see what happened first. Then he would have saw Flair's interference. Then he could have said, okay, eject Flair from the arena. Or they could have said, no, no, my decision stands. Shawn Michaels wins the match. Because there have been instances where the wrestler's foot has made it to the bottom rope after the three count. And they said, no, you're too late. Yeah, where was uh, where was uh, Cincinnati Bengals head coach Zach Taylor to throw the red challenge flag? Or better yet, where was Chris Jericho to throw the red challenge flag? I'm exactly. challenging the play. <laughs> <laughs> You're challenging. Yeah, I know. All right, we'll go to the replay. You know, but uh, I know yeah. it's wrestling and we're not supposed to use logic. But that was just something that kind of bugged me. It's like I agree. they've done it before. And this uh, was uh, whatever, whatever. This was my other nitpick for the match. Anyway, I feel like this ending was way too complicated for a match like this. Um, I realized this was done to not throw Shawn Michaels too far down the totem pole, but don't you think it's more impressive if Randy Orton just beats Shawn Michaels outright? Like, oh, absolutely. You know, just like how my nitpick, my nitpick at Bad Blood was how Ric Flair won with Randy Orton's help. Like, that mm-hmm. match was going perfectly fine without him. Like, he didn't need the interference. Right. Right, for sure. So, um... The match basically continues. Ric Flair runs into the ring. Shawn Michaels hits a uh, sweet chin music. Michaels tries to suplex Randy Orton back into the ring, but with a pair of brass knuckles provided to him by the nature boy himself, Orton punches Michaels in the face over and over and over again. Knocks Michaels 
unconscious for a three count. Randy Orton beats Shawn Michaels in his first one-on-one -on -one pay per view match, which is something to say for someone at 23 years old. Again, this now was that's something I would have said. I would have rather seen this match finish with the RKO. I I would have rather seen the. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I feel like this finish was way too darn complicated. I think it would have screamed a little overbooked. Yeah, it would have uh, would have done volumes for Randy Orton's character at this time, especially. But I feel like his booking would consistently get better up until around this point next year in 2004. Randy Orton's booking is someone to watch for um, on these pods here. But yeah, this was definitely the right move. The match went 19 minutes if you're rounding it up. It's a three and three quarter star match for me, my friend. This is the best match on the show by a country mile, in my opinion. Uh, the crowd was into this the most. Either either guy could have won this. Like the right move was Randy Orton, like Shawn Michaels putting Randy Orton over here. But I mean, in in kayfabe, either one of them could have taken this one home. Oh yeah, absolutely. I do think the right choice was to go with Randy Orton because, like you said, this was his first pay per view match. And just to get this guy, you know, even from then, you knew that they were going to do big things with Randy Orton. So why not just drop the rocket to him now? And that's exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, but before we get to this next match, we do cut to the backstage area with La Resistance in the trainer's room. Somehow Rob Conway's head is not rolling off of the table um, after being uh, put through the tables. But Chris Jericho comes in randomly. This is not the only time you're going to see a random Chris Jericho pop up on this Unforgiven 2003 show. He walks in. He basically is lamenting to La Resistance about how Stone Cold Steve Austin is a tyrant as Raw General Manager. And uh, he's like, yeah, if he hadn't put those titles on the line, you know, this is basically – you get what I'm getting at, right? Stone Cold Steve Austin is bad for business. So he's going to go and confront him. He's going to go do something about it. And La Resistance is rallying behind Chris Jericho, fellow Canadians as they would be even though they're portrayed as French guys right now. But uh, in any case, um, up next... Yeah, more on that later. Like I was saying, this is planting seeds for one of the bigger angles that are going to be on Raw, yes. not on this show. Tag Team Wrestling indeed up next in the women's division as the women's champion Molly Holly teams up with Gail Kim. Who forgot Gail Kim was on a WWE pay-per-view at this point? Raise your hand. Anybody I remember this? her being in WWE around this point, but I don't remember her being on pay-per-view. Yeah, <laughs> they, they gave her like a weird like Matrix style gimmick. I want to say there was a uh, there was a Matrix sequel out this at this point. I mean, not not hey, that no I care. Vince McMahon with his gimmicks, God damn it! <laughs> not that I care, Mr. McMahon. I'm gay. Oh, you're gonna be the Matrix, damn it! You're gonna be Keanu Reeves. <laughs> you're gonna be that shit on the Matrix. God, yeah. Put the major thing behind you. It's going to be great. <sighs> yeah, this is such good shit. Um, but yeah, those two are teaming up to take on Trish Stratus and returning Lita after the neck injury that she sustained. The only time we're talking about Lita this month on the pod. I because was going to say, is... I, know, I know it's a Saudi pay-per-view. Can I just get this out of the way now? I Lita looks great, and I'm so happy she's wrestling. Lita, yeah, yeah. Lita like looks like she could go for a few years if she wanted to. I am so excited for that match. Probably the match I'm looking forward to the most on that pay-per-view out of all of them, amazingly enough. Oh, yeah, and the build has been good. Mm -hmm. Becky Lynch versus Lita is money, my friends. But uh, here she is in 2003. It looks like she is not aged at all if you look at her 19 oh, years after not. the fact. But, uh, no, she looks great, gang. She looks great here. Um, JR was very concerned about Lita's neck. Lita took a beating in this match. Did you notice how she was standing there waiting for the hot tag? Her mouth just starts bleeding profusely. Like, she wipes oh, it yeah. away, and then they're just, like, <laughs> spewing out like a garden hose. Lita's hardcore. She's oh, a also... It's a raw pay-per-view, and I have to make a jab at Jerry Lawler. Uh, Gail Kim comes out, and he says, time for puppies. I'm like, oh, shut up. Yeah, shut up, Jerry Lawler. Your job shut is up. on the line. Your job is like, on the line this later is, in the show. This Be is careful. Why Gail, this is why Gail Kim hates WWE. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry Lawler. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all your fault, Jerry Lawler. Yeah, you're welcome for uh, getting your job screwed over in, the, in a few matches after this. But... Uh, Anyway, I mean, this is, like, honestly, this is your pretty basic tag team match, but it's a pretty good wrestling match, all things considered. Trish Stratus is taking the heat. Uh, she does hit the Stratosphere, I want to say, on Gail Kim. Um, I don't exactly remember. There was a case where Molly Holly was going for a Molly go round. Lita gets the hot tag. She's running wild. She hits a reverse twist of fate on Molly Holly, and then a Lita salt. 
JR was selling it like, oh, no, Lita can't do this with her bum neck. She can't do it. But lo and behold, she does. And this is this is WWE booking like, you know, quintessential WWE with a top challenger pinning your division's champion in a tag match. Here it is on pay-per-view. <laughs> Lita pins Molly Holly clean as a freaking whistle after the lead assault. And uh, she's like, yeah, I'll see you at Survivor Series in a couple months for that uh, women's title you got there. But, uh, I mean, this is two and a half stars. I really – I like the match. There's not really a whole lot to report about it, honestly. Trish Stratus and no. Gail Kim getting it on was yeah. fun. but It's a shame that it only went six minutes. Uh, again, this is quintessential WWE booking. Um, hopefully, Charlotte Flair – Sonya Deville, Naomi, and Ronda Rousey get a lot more time than this. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it'll be that there's a lot of parallels to this Saturday with Lita and Goldberg and a women's tag team match. Oh, boy. Oh, weird. boy. Uh, really, really Very weird. Down. Very weird. So, hey, this is, this is relevant to what's going on today. <laughs> Yeah, it is relevant. Yeah, there you go. There you go. With three women's matches on the Blood Money show, somehow, some way. I think that's awesome. I think that's really, really awesome. Yeah, um, it is awesome. It just sucks that they're all going to be wrestling in jumpsuits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, God forbid, uh, Rhea, Rhea Ripley shows a little bit too much shoulder. Ay, ay, ay. But, uh, oh, Tomas, it's time. It's, it's time. time. It's time. For what I like to call the Kane and Shane duology. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Kane and Shane, get ready for us to be talking about a lot, a lot. It's a good thing we went into the build in the Star Slam review because this is basically the continuation of the Kane and Shane rivalry, complete with electrocution of the testicles. Did you hear that, Zach? Please come. I back. heard you. I want to talk about the electrocution of the testicles. Okay, here, hold on. Let me come back. I want to talk about uh, Shane getting his balls, like, fried on Monday Night Raw. Hold on. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I... See, I heard Last Man Standing match, and my instinct was to leave the room. I but, didn't even uh... say Last Man Standing match. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you said Shane and Kane. Their first match is a... Shane and Kane. The worst so... fucking stipulation. But, yeah, so... so... <laughs> on an episode of Raw, Kane and Shane were fighting... They made their way down to ringside. Um, Kane takes jumper cables, which are for some reason under the ring. Yeah. And he yeah. can Why he wouldn't they? click, click. <laughs> you see the sparks. And he hooks them to Shane's testicles and he <laughs> electrocutes them. Yep. Yep. So uh, did so, you notice? It's a little Kenyan and they okay. did that. I'm, I'm did concerned. You, okay. The scene in Peacemaker, they did that too. You know Cena told him about that. They did. They did. Said, and hey. I was like, yeah, that's a that's a Shane McMahon reference if I ever saw one right there. And that you know damn of well now that James Gunn is a WWE fan. Because yep. <laughs> Cena probably said, hey, you remember Kane and Shane? And James was like, fuck yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> SmackDown guest host James Gunn, sign me up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, we have a fucking last man standing match here. And you guys all know how much I hate the fucking last man standing match. Anytime I... See one, I just want to throw myself out the fucking window just because of how boring it's going to be. Oh, yeah. Um, Kane and Shane in the last man standing match. Before we get to that real quick, also on an episode of Raw, uh, Kane kicked – and Shane kicked Kane into, like, a pit of fire. And Kane it was a dumpster die. that Kane had set on fire. And then and Shane Kane turned didn't tables. Die. Shane, yeah, and uh, Kane didn't die. Shane iconically says, burn in hell, you son of a bitch. And this was, like – the this was like the saga of them trying to maim each other, like on Monday Night Raw. And this all came after Kane tombstoned Linda McMahon. Thumbs up. I love that. That's my favorite fucking Raw moment of all time. Is Kane tombstoning <laughs> Linda McMahon? There you go. On the stage. I have and issues. Like you said, you I don't. have issues. <laughs> you don't mess with Shane's mama. And here we have the match and our last man standing match. The best stipulation to ever grace the sport of professional wrestling. Uh, why? At, why at is least, it the best? At least this match starts off with your favorite trope. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. With Shane. Uh, so Kane is walking out to the ring. Yeah. Let me describe this real quick. Kane had been like wearing the weird like mesh attire that he was wearing the whole time. Now he's coming out with a brand spanking new clean ass set of uh, tights out to the ring with the uh, iconic like stitching there. Yeah. Like he it's a, the singlet. Thank God. Yeah. It's an iconic unmasked Kane look for sure that he would carry on for years and years after this. Slow chemical is playing. Kane is walking down to the ring. And then there goes Shane McMahon from behind with a steel chair attacking Kane. I mean, I don't want to give this match too much credit because of the fucking stipulation, but Come there on, were some there were some match. fun. I will match. admit, I will admit there were some fun little sequences of violence in there. Um, but the thing is, referee Charles Robinson, four, five. Oh, they're up like. <laughs> What the how else are you supposed to win a last man standing match? How, how do you make a last man standing match better? Like, if you want the answer to that, just make it a false count anywhere match. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot more fast paced. This and match was like 16 it's minutes. It's the build up of a big spot happening and seeing if he can make it. It's like boxing. You know, in boxing, they knocked them out and they got to make okay. a count. There's no fucking way that the boxing count is that slow. Like, if anybody's watching a boxing match, if anybody sees fucking... Even the Brawl for All matches, there's no fucking way the referees count that slow. But it's about the drama and the tension. <sighs> you gotta see if they're gonna make it back to their feet in time. Yeah, in that case, last man standing matches would be only, like, three minutes if they knocked somebody out and the ref counted, like, so fast. I would not be opposed because that means less last man standing match that I have to watch, but... Um, <laughs> it's, uh, okay, so there's only one memorable spot of this match, and there is one spot that I know Tomas wants to talk about, and it does involve a heavy set of steel steps that Kane introduces into this match. Um, would you like to elaborate on this? Uh, when does that happen? Does it's... this happen after the chair shots? I think so. I think so. Like, they were just, I mean, it was your pretty basic brawl on the outside of the ring. And then I think what happened was Kane hit a choke slam, And then Shane, like, Shane brings in the freaking, uh, whatchamacallit, the, the, the steel steps. And then, like, Kane is in the corner. Kane's in the corner. Shane's setting it up coast to coast. Hits Kane right in the face. Kane is out. You know, <laughs> like, and yes, the match, it's last the, man the, the standing. Coast coast, it yeah. sucks. <laughs> last man standing but it's sucks. It's the tension. It's a buildup for the 10 count. Uh, I can't enjoy the tension if I know, like, the near falls could be done a lot quicker and a lot more entertaining. But, uh, well, thankfully for you, the match is almost over because they start uh, fighting their way up the stage. And you got to admit, the finish was pretty cool. Okay. So before you get to that, Kane is throwing little McMahon into the freaking unforgiven sign at the entrance way. And you have freaking like, <laughs> like Shane is getting, it's not King of the ring 2001. This ain't, I'll just tell you that much. You know, Shane did not get his ass handed to him. You're he right. Wasn't, it's better. No, no, there's no way this was better than King of the ring 2001. <laughs> like the freaking fact that he got through that match with Kurt in the street fight, like is still a fucking miracle. But this match with Kane looked like it was fucking safe, like child's play almost. Uh, I mean, Shane was taking some sick bumps. Like, yeah, I was gonna say, you know what's no not discredit. child's play? Uh, this finish. Oh, it's it's not. But Shane, like, so there's a point where Kane. Hold on a second. I know you want to talk about the finish, but Kane almost like kills Shane McMahon, shoving the Spanish announce table on top of him. Shane avoided it, hits Kane with a crane camera, and literally cracks the lens. Like, you see it on the replay. Like, I will admit, that part of the match was pretty cool. They showed on the replay, cool. using that camera, lens cracked. And that was pretty dope. That was a dope little effect there. But, yeah, the finish. Take it away. What was it? And a Shane McMahon classic special, he's able to get Kane set up, like, on the stage area that's next to it. He climbs up the set, and he gets on, on the top. And you notice that every time when Shane's going to do this, he has to do his classic crossing the heart yep. like <laughs> let's pray i don't die from this and he jumps from 25 feet in the air and he misses crashes he sure does 
there is a crash pad there, but you gotta tell that was not fun to land on because there's still like a thin layer of wood that he had to destroy. Mm-hmm. Yep, there sure was. There sure was. Kane moved out of the way, and thank God that a non-wrestler did not beat Unmasked Kane in one of the biggest missed booking opportunities of all time to present Unmasked Kane like an unbeatable monster. But Shane McMahon I mean, got so close. Th the good guy could have won at least once in this feud, because then there's no reason to have a rematch, but... Yeah, only I mean... <sighs> I mean, they were. I mean, they were building up Shane McMahon as like the no fear kid who was like, you know, standing up to the monster who tombstoned his mother. By the way, thumbs up. I'd like to remind everybody that Kane tombstoned Linda McMahon on Raw. But I mean, it's a, it's obviously a gimmick stage at the end. It's not going to be like Shane's taking a bump on concrete. That, Safety it first still for a like stunt it like hurt, that, though. Oh yeah, so that wood just explodes around him. It totally hurt. It totally hurt. I mean, I'd like to ask Shane if it hurt, you know, to, you know, know for sure. But... I would too, but he got released. <laughs> Re... A little too His soon for that. Fired him. Probably the reason His why Cody Rhodes... Fired him. Probably the reason why Cody Rhodes is getting signed instead. But anyway, um, I mean... This is two and three quarters for me. I can't give it three. Two and three quarters. It's, yeah, it's I can't I cannot give it three because it's last man standing. Like it was fun. I gave it three and a half. <laughs> I mean It was fun. I mean, to each their Can own. At least say their ambulance match was better. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Their ambulance match was way better because at least the stipulation doesn't bog the match down. But um I mean I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be talking about a last man standing match and having this argument on the air, but uh, yeah, I just, I couldn't get into this, but anyway, uh, next up is a match that I'll let you introduce, but I forgot about this match. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was so right before this match, you have Stone Cold Steve Austin sitting in his office, watching the, uh, watching the solemn, tasteless Owen Hart voice tone as Shane McMahon is being stretchered out of the arena. But um, Chris Jericho storms into Stone Cold's office and he's like, you see what happens? Now you see Shane McMahon is hurt because of this damn match that was put together. And I'm going to make sure that you're not the general manager come Survivor Series, which, spoiler alert, happens. But um, Chris Jericho is in this next match. He is one of two people challenging for the Intercontinental Championship along with Rob Van Dam. The champion, of course, is Christian, who was not on the SummerSlam card for whatever reason. And I believe... Uh, here's a consolation prize, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the build <laughs> for this match was fairly simple. Um, Van Damme and Jericho were having a number one contenders match for the belt on Raw. Christian basically interrupts it, hits both of them with the belt, thinking he doesn't have to defend the title against either one of them at Unforgiven. Stone Cold basically says, fuck it, you got to defend against both of them now. Triple threat. It's when a are wrestlers going to learn that that never works? Yeah, it's a it's a trope. It's a tale as old as time. You know, that trope is never going to break. So, um, this is, I mean, it was... Also, Booker T is nowhere to be found on this show. <sighs> isn't isn't that fun? Yeah, isn't that fun? very fun. Yeah, nowhere to be found. Why not make this a fatal four-way, please? Like, that would have been great. But... I will admit, yeah, Tomas did say, like, before we started recording that this match was very long. And, yes, it went darn near 20 minutes. Um, but I think a big portion of why the crowd was dead wasn't necessarily the, the match length. I think it's mainly this match order. I think having this spot in the death spot after seeing a big Shane McMahon stunt like that, like, of course they're going to be solemnly quiet up until the finish. Oh, of the yeah, game. and I don't want to say do this to the women, but if they were to swap this in a tag match, I'm just saying the women's match had, like, no stakes involved. It wasn't a championship match or anything. Or, and I hate to do that to the ladies, but... Or fuck it, or, have this... I have, mean... Have this match open the show. Like, you don't have to have the Dudleys there. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know... No, you fuck it, no. The ladies deserve their spot. Put Tessa Steiner in this in that slot. Yep, yep. That's that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. But no, they get their video package. And they get their video package, and the Intercontinental Championship is relegated to the death spot. Vince McMahon already does not yeah. care about this fucking belt. Like four months after being reincarnated here. So the big story of this match that they were trying to sell because Christian and Jericho are still best friends at this point, correct? 
Yes, yes. Yeah, so I guess they were looking they, to... They would, yeah, they'll be friends until the end of, well, the beginning of next year when Christian turns on him at WrestleMania. Yeah, so we still got some Jericho-Christian friendship to go through. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a very uh, underrated partnership, if you ask me. Very underrated feud. But it's a, I mean, it's a good story. It's a good story. I mean, Jericho and Christian are working together on Van Dam, who's in a very vulnerable situation. But then there's a point where Jericho wants to be the Intercontinental Champion too much, and then the two buddies turn on each other, and then they start fighting. And then the match... Yeah, starts. it's a very... The two-on-one stuff is fun, especially when RVD starts to come back because it turns less into a triple threat and more of RVD kneeling to deal with the double threat he has in front of him before he mm-hmm. can focus on winning the Intercontinental Championship. Also, this format made RVD look like a really strong baby face, which he was always yeah. good at, but, you know, get him the sympathy when you can. He was always a strong baby face, for sure. Um, he had just come off of a feud with his former tag team partner at SummerSlam in a very fun no-holds-barred match. Uh, very, very, uh, very much better than the last man standing match that we just I saw. Was but, say, that uh, yeah, it's better than the last man standing. That's right. That's right. Because I could, you know, it's only a three count. That's a way to see if the match is over. So, the last um, man standing is pretty close, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's each their own. I feel like we're going to dwell on this a long time. Every single podcast now. Oh, it's never going to end. It's no. never going to end. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's just not going to end. Um, But yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting finish. So Jericho, there's a point where he hits a top rope Judas effect on Christian, by the way, which I was like, Jericho is hitting that move all the time. And they're playing it off to be a big deal against Juventude. Like, oh, Jericho doesn't have a top rope move as a finisher. Top rope Judas hey, if effect. If Jericho ever tries to pull the excuse, oh, that was back in 2003. No, motherfucker. You wrote an entire book chronologizing every single yeah. match you have ever wrestled, including house shows, including when it was, where it was, what show it was, who won the match, and how they won the match. So don't sit there and say you don't remember. And how you, you rated do. the match, Chris. <laughs> So if anybody, if Jericho ever tries to pull that BS, I'm going to pull out the list of Jericho and go. <laughs> You're just You're wrong. find the match. <laughs> um, all, his whole career is chronologically is documented. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm I'm actually kind of curious to see what Chris himself rated this match specifically because, like, it's a very polarizing match. I I really keep enjoyed it. About the match. I really enjoyed it. Keep, there keep was a point where uh, Van Dam hits a uh, five-star frog splash on uh, Christian and Jericho at the same time, which I have dubbed the sixty-nine frogs, uh, the sixty-nine star frog splash, which is nice. Uh, it's nice. a nice move. Yeah, it's a nice move for sure. Um, but then, yeah, Van Dam. There's a point where he uh, covers covers Jericho. I think. Yeah, no, he covers Jericho. Christian breaks it up. Uh, Van Dam is setting Jericho up on the turnbuckle for a superplex, which honestly leads to a point where the crowd comes alive. If that 69 star frog splash did not wake them up already. Nice. Um, Van Dam goes for a superplex. Christian basically is, uh, <laughs> Christian gets Van Dam in a power bomb position. And then there's an electric chair drop. And basically what happens is there's a gigantic tower of doom, which is customary for triple threat matches. But, I don't remember that spot ever taking place. A power bomb into an electric chair. That was really cool. That was really cool seeing that again. Um, so getting back to the match, Christian goes back into the ring with the championship, uh, which was customary for his title matches around this point to cheat via title shots. Um, Van Dam is tripping him up. Um, RVD jumps off with the five-star frog splash. Um, three stars. Three stars. Okay. Well, yeah, I actually rated three it. Three stars. I actually rated it three and a quarter, so um, I think I liked it more than Chris did. So um, Jericho, so the referee, for some reason, was distracted by Jericho trying to bring a chair into the ring. Van Dam kicks Jericho off the apron. Nick All Patrick uh, recommended, for sure, absolutely, the list of Jericho. Uh, the referee is preoccupied. Jericho on the outside doesn't see Christian get his knees up and the title belt on top of his knees, so Van Dam sickly hits the frog splash on the championship belt. Christian pins Van Dam and retains. Awesome. Awesome. And then Christian actually celebrates like he just won the Super Bowl, like he's the stupid L.A. Rams right now. But uh, I'm giving this three and a quarter. Three and a quarter. It was fun. But, uh, again, the crowd, I feel like this match, I feel like. Yeah, that's the biggest issue with it. It was put in the wrong spot. Yeah. Yeah. It was. uh, 
yeah, very, very odd match order for the night, to say the very least. Um, I mean, there's nothing nothing wrong with the match, nothing wrong with the workers in the match. I think they all work well together. Um, the Tower of Doom spot and the 69-star Frog Splash are both highlights for sure. But, uh, I mean, you know, nothing really much else to write home about, unfortunately. It wasn't overly remarkable. Oh. Did you just say unfortunately? Yeah. Because that's what this next match really is. It's unfortunate. Mm. It is. Good old JR Jim Ross teaming with his buddy Jerry the King Lawler to take on Jonathan Coachman and Al Snow. Oh yeah, I would love this to have. A video. I would love to have. Al Imagine. Snow. No, 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 no. I'm gonna stop you right there. Imagine. <laughs> okay. You have your Go ahead. pick of the litter. You have your pick of the litter of the Monday Night Raw, Monday Night Raw roster. You could pick any single wrestler you possibly could. Oh you boy. Could pick, I don't think Batista's doing anything that night. Hmm, no, um, <laughs> I bet if you were nice enough, you could talk Kane into doing it. He's not that banged up from it. Um, you could talk to ah, Tess got a big win. Maybe call up, likes, you know, call up Gene Snitsky from OBW. What is he doing? Huh? You're a big bad heavy. Yeah, you're going yeah, to Snitsky you is. Ow. Like... No, I would love for Al Snow to be my tag team partner because he has done it all and won it all in this business, except for the How world championship. Worse? I would love for Al Snow to be my commentator partner because that's the story behind this. Coach yeah. is a heel. He doesn't like Jr. and Lawler. He wants them off the commentary team. So the stipulation of this match is winners become the Monday Night Raw announced team starting the following night on Raw. And like we talked about last time, uh, this match is in complete silence. You know what? You. you know what, though? I can't believe I'm saying this, but the video package kind of showed me that Coach was justified in his heel turn. I can't believe I'm saying that because... After the all the abuse he took from The Rock? After all the abuse he took from The Rock, not only that, but also when he filled in for JR on commentary for the short time he did in the spring earlier this year... He was decent. He was a solid play-by-play -play guy, honestly. Not to discredit the coach at all. I mean, he has a great, great gig with ESPN right now and all that stuff. But, I mean, he wasn't bad. He wasn't bad at all. And then, in his mind, JR coming back and telling him to get out of his seat was an insult to him. So, he basically does the only thing he could. So, line himself with the devil himself with the shit-eating grin. And, uh, you know, basically try and get himself full-time on Raw and... Uh, I mean, yeah, I would have definitely chosen a better tag team partner than Al oh, Snow. Yeah, exactly. He's justified, sure. but he picked a shitty tag team partner. Yeah, fuck Al Snow. Fuck Al Snow. <laughs> so we get this match in complete silence. You couldn't have called up Michael Cole and Taz to do like a surprise calling of this match. Yeah, JR. It, it, have the King even made something. a. Admittedly, the King did make a funny joke while Coach and Al Snow were making their entrance. He was like, hey, JR, you know what I just realized? Who's going to call this match? <laughs> I'm like, Nobody. he's fucking right. He's fucking right, isn't he? Now, did we? You know, like. <sighs> it's, so, it's like when Lawler and Michael Cole fought at WrestleMania. At least they brought Booker T and Josh Matthews to fill the void. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, but it's complete silence and the crowd is not into this match at all. They know this is their piss no. break match or their beer break match. Uh, much like Scott Steiner versus Test, and shout out to the guy sitting hard cam side who held up a beer match sign in the background to <laughs> kind of uh, put a label on it, which I think was great. This match, I think, was definitely way more of a uh, beer match than anything. I, I'll give them credit for at least trying to be smart and having the trained wrestlers in Lawler and, yes, Al Snow trying to work most of the match. Um, but then there's a point where Coach wants that hot tag, him and his Kansas State gear, Kansas State Wildcat alumni there. He goes into the ring, tries to get some of the king, and JR has had enough. Um, he starts waffling the coach, and bless JR's heart, but these are some of the worst he's punches you'll ever see. He's trying. He's trying his damnedest, but he's not a wrestler. Absolutely not. He does not a, a smart, smart spot where the referee is distracted just long enough so we can low blow snow. <laughs> low blow snow. Yeah, <laughs> I made it the funny. crowd. The uh, crowd was, gets rid of Al Snow. The crowd was chanting "We want Jr." too, as the King was hitting a body slam, making it look and easy on Al Snow. Once Al Snow was out of the equation, Jr. hit the worst looking clothesline I've ever seen in my life. Oh, poor Jr. Jr. You've been in this <laughs> business how JR. long? You can't pull one of the wrestlers to a side to teach you to do a simple clothesline. 
if you know you're being forced to work a match. You know, I, I mean, I, I hate nitpicking on this match too much because, I mean, let's face it, there's two, there's two, well, the King has been retired for a while at this point in his career, and Al Snow is not a very good professional wrestler. JR and the coach are not wrestlers at all. So putting these ingredients together just comes up with a disaster worth of a match. JR, I think he's going for like a submission hold or something like that on the coach. And then out of nowhere, fucking Chris Jericho comes in, drop kicks JR, throws the coach on top of JR, and the coach and Al Snow get to broadcast Monday Night Raw the next night. This stipulation literally means nothing about eight days after this because I believe they would win their jobs back. Like, you know, not really, like, not even 24 hours after. After like I don't even remember wh- how they got back how how they got their match their jobs back I don't even remember either I think Tomas is fact checking this right now but uh, right now I'm gonna see if he doesn't even say there yeah I mean I really don't have much to say about this but suffice to say this was a terrible match minus two stars um I mean the king was really 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 trying to carry this. Um, and he knew he had to carry it because he had two non-wrestlers in there and, uh, Al Snow, but, uh, I, yeah, yeah, bad match, bad match. This was the death, death spot right there. Um, the, uh, yeah, thank God, thank God it didn't last that long, <laughs> you know? I mean, I think it only, oh God, wait a minute. No, it did last too long. It was fucking eight minutes, Tomas. That was longer than... Two other matches on this show. What the fuck? This match was longer than Scott Steiner versus Tess. <laughs> How yes. is that possible? How? How was this match one of the longer ones? <sighs> I don't get it. I really, I really don't get it. But uh, nobody believed it would it's be almost the end over, of ladies and gentlemen. Jr. and Jerry Lawler on commentary, but yeah, it's <laughs> the we'll put you out of your misery after this match here. Triple H is defending the World Heavyweight Championship against Goldberg. And the stipulation is if Goldberg oh. loses, he has to retire. So there's a I lot. I fucking of hate that stipulation. Really? Why? It might as well just put the writing on the wall. This person's not going to lose. Mm. Well, I mean, it, I guess it depends on the situation. Um, exactly. You can see it's like basically them giving away the finish of the match without giving away the finish. Well, if it were someone that was on the verge of retirement, like say – Say The Undertaker was going into WrestleMania 26 as the World Heavyweight Champion, and say you put Shawn Michaels in there with him. You really think that, you know, it's written on the wall that Shawn Michaels is going to break the streak? Like, I think, again, I think it depends on the situation. Exactly, but yeah. Here, if you're absolutely Taker right. If Taker went into that Mania as champion, it'd be a little <laughs> less predictable, but since it wasn't a title match, I we saw that it was time for Michaels to hang it up. Yeah, but um, here, at this point, it's like Goldberg's been here for like what, not even six months, and you really think they're gonna make him retire right here? No, 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 um, no, 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 no. Goldberg I will signed say, though. He signed on the dotted line for one year. Oh, on yeah. one year, yeah. Jr.'s little speech before the match that got me. That really fucking they really made you feel like they were done. Yeah, yeah. Jr. was in tears. The King was, uh, you know, comforting him, and uh, they were like. They really oh, gonna, sold that shit. We're going to make this the best damn match we've ever called. And uh, JR was yeah. excellent in this match. You know, the commentator... It's a damn shame it was all for nothing. Yeah, I know, right? I know. It's very reminiscent of, in the future, John Cena's speech after Survivor Series 2010, where he swore he was going to leave, and then he was back that night, and then he was back the next week. Like, he was Cena back really that night to cost the Nexus all their shit. <laughs> yeah, and it's like they Cena really made you feel like he was leaving. <laughs> it's like they that was all for nothing. Man, oh man. man I'm gonna oh let man. you finish, but I'm just gonna say right now that Mark Henry had the greatest fake retirement of all time. <laughs> the salmon <laughs> jacket Nobody speech is ever, ever, ever gonna beat Mark Henry. Fucking love that he had moment. Me crying. It's he the had best me thing. crying in the minute he took down Cena. I was like, you motherfucker. <laughs> oh man, it was it was literally the best thing Mark Henry has ever done in his career. Oh yeah. Uh, so this match, honestly, this is a below average main event. I mean, this is not a match that plays to Goldberg's strengths at all. This match rounding up went 15 minutes, um, which is way too long for Goldberg. I think 10 minutes even is pushing it. 
Um, but his matches, both his matches against The Rock and Chris Jericho were at least fun and entertaining. I don't think Triple H was the right opponent for him. Um, no, absolutely not. I mean, it Neither was... Neither time. Because this no. Is the only time we're going to see this No, 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 no. This was your Survivor Series main event as well, ladies and gentlemen. But, uh, um... I mean, there's some there's some flashes of good stuff in here. Um, I mean, there's some good athletic, you know, moves. Hunter is clotheslining, but you could tell uh, – clotheslining Goldberg, rather. But you can tell that Hunter was a little bit more limited in what he could do because he was still dealing with his groin injury, and he still has that weird, forgettable, biker short Hunter Hearst Helmsley look. Wow. Uh, it's not like you could take the title off of him and let him recuperate. SummerSlam? Yeah. Huh? Let- take it off of him at SummerSlam? If you were going to put the title on Goldberg here, you might as well have done it a month before. Let Triple H go home. Let Goldberg yeah. challenge some new opponents on Raw. And then when he comes back, just resume business like nothing ever happened. Right. Right. But no. No, you have to get this one-on-one match uh, with Goldberg out of the way before he can go off and recuperate from the injury. Not only that, but this will play into a match at no mercy, but he would also be going to get married to Stephanie McMahon in real life. They would be married in kayfabe, but they would um, – in real life, I believe they uh, I believe they were wed Oct- – oh, I, God, I don't remember the exact date, but I want to say it was like October 20-something of 2003 – which adds up because No Mercy was October 19th. But um, Triple H, there's a point where Earl Hebner, of course, has to take a ref bump because it's a Triple H World Heavyweight Championship match. Um, He pulls out Sledgy, his favorite weapon, the Sledgehammer, cracks Goldberg literally in the fucking jaw with that thing. Like, that made a sound. (laughs) Like, it was a loud one, like a loud pop. (laughs) Yeah. Goldberg sold it as such at first. Like he, the face Goldberg had when he was hit with a sledgehammer was like, oh my god, he legit knocked him unconscious. But nope, Goldberg pops right back up and hits him with a spear and a jackhammer to win. Like, <laughs> it's like you could have sold the sledgehammer a little longer, dude. You know? No, but this is Goldberg we're talking about. Yeah. This is probably the worst case scenario you could have put either of these guys in. This was not a fun match. It was so. There was if you were gonna overbook something, at least overbook the. Oh wait, no, they do that Survivor Series, and it still sucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least when you add a safe worker like Kane into the mix, the match improves a little bit, but not by much. Um, these two just never really had the best chemistry in the world. I think you nope. know Goldberg. Goldberg is more of a mauler, and Triple H wanted to work a more like Harley Race style match, which never really fit into. Uh, yep. But Goldberg's... for the first time since '98, I want to say Goldberg has big, big Goldie has the big gold belt back around. He his does. Neck. He he, he has the big Glodblet. He's holding it over his head, and after nine months of Triple H as the world champion, by the way, we get a little bit of a reprieve from seeing him with the title. So. Oh, there you go. are you guys surprised that we're not celebrating that the fact that the, the reign of terror is over? <laughs> That's because it's not. <laughs> it's not over. It's, it's not over by a long time. It's not over. It's if not anything, over. If anything, it's just getting started. Mm-hmm. We got a lot more terror to get through. It sure is. It sure is. So enjoy, again, enjoy this little break. It's not going to last long. Enjoy this little reprieve from Triple H at the top as the world champion. Um, until December. Until <laughs> until December, which is uh, which is May, our time, when we talk about Armageddon. But, uh, my friends, this is a bad show. I'm going to give it a four and a half out of ten. This is, you know, not a show. Agreed. I mean. Right there with you. It's probably it's probably memorable for all the wrong reasons. Um, when a last man standing match is considered a stronger match on this show, it's probably not that great. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you do get a solid Shawn Michaels versus Randy Orton encounter, which would be, you know, upper tier, upper tier match. Like, if you had, like, a another, like, five-star match on it to compliment it. But Shawn Michaels' back must have been killing him after this because he was carrying Raw on his back. Yeah. Him and, him and Randy Orton both. Like, honestly, I would argue that Randy Orton was Raw's workhorse. You know? Like, it was appalling. Absolutely appalling. But... 
Raw's television, I mean, it wouldn't be much better. I mean, Christian would lose the Intercontinental Championship shortly after this show to Van Damme in a very underrated ladder match on an episode of Raw, which I urge everybody to go out and watch because that ladder match, way better than anything else on this show. Why was that ladder match not on here? <laughs> you know, I love that match. It's actually, it is featured on RVD's uh, One of a Kind DVD that was released back in 04, 05, something like that. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't watch anything on this show. If anything, if you want to see the Shane McMahon bump, I guess. If you want to suffer through a last man standing match, you're welcome to. Um, it depends on who you talk to, though, because Tomas will say that a last man standing match is not pain and suffering for the viewer. It's good. No, it's, it's a, not. It's a, it's a good, it's a good uh, concept, if you ask me. Oh. Uh, I'm never going to be able to convince him, my friends, but uh, never. yeah, so we got No Mercy next month, which is a SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view. You all know SmackDown is much better than Raw at this point in the Ruthless Aggression era, so I'm very excited to do that. AEW Revolution, like I said, will be a little bit on the later side because I will be in the Tech and Hell Week for the show that I'm in right now, so uh, stay tuned for that. We will get to it when we uh, do have the time on our hands. Um, and, of course, I talk about all things cinema and entertainment over here on the regular. Um, you can look forward to reviews for The Batman, which comes out March 4th. Freaking finally. I can't wait to talk about that. Un uh, Uncharted comes out this weekend. So, Thank you. I was going to say, please tell me you're reviewing Uncharted. I sure am. I sure am. Yeah, Uncharted is going to be so much fun. But, uh, yeah, smash that subscribe button and that notification bell right next to it if you haven't already. Let's go ahead and round up to 1,000 subscribers while we're at it. Uh, smash that thumbs up button on your way out. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is this has been a fun, cathartic pod, Tomas. I wish it was a better show that we had on our hands, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad. it's always fun to talk about, no matter what. Oh yeah, oh for sure, for sure, my friend. And I hope you guys had as much fun listening as much as uh, we did discussing it. So uh, see you guys for the next one. Yeah.